So I was introduced to uh, uh, both Neil and the sequence database when I was hanging around the Bell Labs uh, Computer Science Center as a high school student. And looking back, I'm struck by how welcoming Neil was of contributions, as we heard uh, Jeffrey talk about too, uh, from this inexperienced 15-year-old. And it was a great learning experience for me in many ways. And, and as you all know, it's how Neil treats all contributors, no matter how much or little experience they have. And I believe that culture is a big part of why the OAS has succeeded the way it has. So thank you, Neil, for that, and a happy birthday. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about two computationally difficult sequences that I've worked on. I think they're fascinating, and I hope that many of you at least find them interesting. <coughs> I also hope that a few of you might be able to help with some of the math to help us get a little further. Uh, there's some interesting open questions. The first one is, is in the database as A056287. It's a measure of the complexity of Boolean functions over N inputs. And the second, oops. The second one is A129403, which is a measure of the complexity of certain regular expressions of length n. So I'm going to start with uh, the first one. It's uh, inspired by some of Claude Shannon's early work on circuit design, although he didn't use that exact term, and, and his definition of circuit was a little different. But the class of circuits he was building corresponded roughly to Boolean functions of ands and ors over input variables and input variable negations. And so a reasonable question is, What's the worst case minimum number of operations for an n input Boolean function? And as I remember it, Neil posted this question to Seek fans around New Year's 2001. I think he'd been looking at that paper. And he had computed the first two terms by hand and asked if anyone could compute a few more. And so for n equals 2, it's the second term, but it's the first non trivial one. Uh, the worst function f is the parity function, the xor function, x plus y equals 1. And you can realize it with three operators as x or y and not x or not y. And when I read Neil's mail, I thought, well, I, I think I can probably do an exhaustive search for this uh, to get the next few terms. And so I did. <coughs> and the first step is to observe that you can map each function to a truth table as just an ordinary binary number. <coughs> and then given the truth tables for two functions, if you add them together, you get the truth table for the other ones. And same for or, and same for not. And so uh, this gives you a very efficient way to manipulate these in a program. And they also pack densely. So if you have the function representation, you can store information about it, just indexes into an array, which is nice. And so <clears throat> I came up with this uh, algorithm, which uh, starts by recording the cost of all functions as infinity, and then it records the costs of the individual variables as zero, and then it just starts trying combinations. And while it's finding better costs, it tries all combinations of f and g that it's found so far, and checks to see if anding them or oring them together gives a better cost for the result. And when the costs stop changing and you've checked all the pairs again, you're done. And so um, I think of this as a variation of the, the floyd warshall algorithm for finding the shortest path between all pairs of nodes in a graph. And, and like floyd warshall it's a little bit of overkill. It's not terribly efficient. But it was very simple to write. And for n equals 3 and n equals 4, it was actually reasonable to run. And so we found that a of 3 equals 9. And there's only one uh, you know, function that actually uh, achieves that, and that's the parity function for the three inputs. Running the program for about an hour, I found that a of 4 was 15. And here there are four distinct functions or function classes that uh, achieve that complexity. And again, the first one is parity. And then there's two more symmetric functions. And then there's this oddball function. This is a symmetric function with one case change, uh, just to you know, screw things up a little bit. And those are the, the four uh, complexity 15 functions. And so at the time, I made this obvious conjecture that um, Maybe it's all. Maybe parity is always the most difficult function. So w, x, y, z are integers. These are the, the, the boolean inputs. <coughs> boolean. Yes, but but there's zero and one for the purpose of plus. And the cost negation is negation is free. Yeah. So you get all the x's and yeah. not x's for free, and it's just the combinations that cost something. Um, and so I said, well, you know, maybe parity is. And, um, well, I was a college senior. I can make conjectures like that. No one cares. Um, and another conjecture I can make that, that no one cared about <coughs> was that, well, maybe parity is always the hardest, and maybe this is, you know, the four numbers we have, maybe it's always a power of 2 plus or minus 1 alternating, and so maybe the next term is 33, and maybe the next term is 63. Um, and that's sort of patently false. If you just sit down and try to write a circuit based on the ones you've built for XOR for 5, it comes out at 27. Um, but, you know, no one did that. Uh, and so in early 2006, I was talking to uh, my then roommate, Alex Healy, about this sequence. And he pointed out that there are some results from circuit complexity, that parity can be done in log depth 
And that means that the, if you expand to you know, not have a circuit but a formula, um, when complexity can't be worse than polynomial in n. And so it's certainly not the case that it grows exponentially and is parity. And so Alex sent this comment to Neil. And Neil put in the database, because Neil was still editing in the database by himself at the time. And he had this great comment. So the first part was, was already in the, the sequence that said that I conjectured that parity was always worse than the next two terms. And he says, but Alex Healy points out that this conjecture is definitely false for large n. So what is a of 5? And uh, so you know, Alex and I would actually uh, throw that back and forth at each other every once in a while. And saying, you know, so what is a of 5? And um, it seemed pretty well out of reach, because you've got this algorithm here. And this first lot, or the inner loop is doing all comparisons of functions, and there's two to the two to the n functions, and so you're doing pairs of them, so there's two to the two to the n plus one pairs. And then as the algorithm proceeds, at the, at the end of the first round, we know we found all the functions of minimum cost one. At the end of the second round, we know we found all the ones of minimum cost two, and maybe some others that aren't minimized yet, and so on. And so you, in the worst case to know you're done, you, you have to, um, you know, once you see everything stop changing, you know you're done, but in the worst case, uh, you might have to run this loop a of n times. So you're looking at co doing combinations for a of n times 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 terms. And so for n equals 5, that ends up being uh, something like 30 times 2 to the 64, which is just not okay. Uh, <coughs> and so, you know, that's going to take a lot more than the half an hour it took for, for n equals 4. And so the first important insight is that we can actually get rid of this leading a of n term. And the way we do this is by constructing the functions in such a way that you, when you get to it, you know it's the minimal cost, as long as you haven't seen it already. So the first time you see any function, that was the minimal cost. And the way you do this is you keep lists of functions of a given cost, and then you put them together in increasing cost order. And so at the beginning, you make the list of all the, the functions of cost zero, which is the x's and not x's. And then for each target cost k, um, <coughs> until you run out of functions, you take all the combinations you can that make k. So you take all the cost 0 and all the cost 1 to make 1s, and then you know 0 plus, or uh, 1 plus 1 to make 2s, and so on. And so in general, you're taking functions f of cost i and functions g of cost k minus 1 minus i, and checking those. And the first time you see any co new combination, that's the minimal cost. And so uh, you only do this combination uh, at most once for every possible pair. So that leading a of n term is now completely gone. You're still at 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1, which is not great, but we did get a factor of 30. So that's something. Yeah. Um, so the next thing we can do is start exploiting some symmetries. <coughs> and so uh, you know, observation you might make is, well, because of De Morgan's laws, the function f and the function not f must have the same complexity. So there's no point in at least storing information about f and not f. You can at least cut your storage in half by um, uh, only storing one of them. And so the inner part of this loop is doing this thing where it says, you know, for each stored f and g, we check f and g, and we check f or g. And so if you're going to only store, you know, half of these functions, either f or its negation, you can have some way to pick which one. Um, then in the inner loop, you, you have fewer functions, so you have to expand them all back out. And so this loop here, assuming we're storing fewer functions, uh, is exactly the same computational cost as before. We're just doing, you know, more work because we were storing fewer options. So we have to do all the combinations of not of f and, and not of g. But again, you can look at this and say, oh, well, wait, by De Morgan's laws, these, these bottom four are actually the same top four permuted. And so we don't have to do those at all. We'll, we'll get them from the first four. And so now we've, we've cut the storage by a factor of two. We've also cut the, uh, the actual computation by a factor of two, because there's half as many things we have to check. And so we were at a of n times two to the two to the n plus one. Now we're at 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 divided by 2, so that's something. Um, it is not 2 to the 2 to the n, unfortunately. Um, and so the next thing you can notice is that, well, there's other symmetries you can exploit. So uh, if you have a function f of x and y, there's the same cost as f of x and not y, because the knots are free, so you can just renegate everything. And so that gives you another 2 to the n that you can approximate <coughs> that, that you can exploit uh, by symmetries and just store them in some canonical setting. And similarly, you can permute the, the variables and not change the cost. And so this gives you, again, roughly an in factorial. So now this is actually getting small enough that maybe we can do something for n equals 5. So for n equals 5, we start with 2 to the 64, and we divide by 2, and we divide by 32, 120, 
And we end up with around 251 operations. And so uh, because we were doing this, um, these truth tables and it's very cheap to sort of iterate over these lists, you can imagine that you might be able to do a billion checks in a second. And so 2 to the 21 seconds is about 20 days. And so you know, we can do that. Um, and so I did that. I actually ran the program. And um, it took about five days, I think. Uh, it, it couldn't actually do 2 to 30 per, per iteration. But you also, uh, some pairs you don't actually get to. Because if your you know, maximum cost is 10, you never try to combine a cost 6 and a cost 7. Because you, just, you're not, you don't get to 13. And, um, and so it turns out you only do about a tenth of the pairs in, in this particular case. And so it ran in about five days. And there's some algorithmic cleverness you can do now that you know, you know sort of where the answer is to switch to a different algorithm for the end game. And you can redo the computation about half a day. And so A of 5 is 28. It's not 33, so I was wrong about that. Um, and parity is not hardest, so I was wrong about that too. Um, but, but the hardest functions are kind of interesting. This top one. You know, every time I see it, I think, oh, maybe that's parity, but it's not. It's missing five. Um, but it is symmetric, so that's something. And then the next two are these, you know, kind of oddball symmetrics with one case changed again, um, which is just a way for the functions to make things a little harder, I think. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's sort of an obvious conjecture here that I'm not going to make, but that might be true that maybe a symmetric function is always one of the hardest ones, right? We saw parity, parity, and now we have this sort of weird <coughs> symmetric, but it's still symmetric. And the, these others are all kind of variants of symmetric. So maybe there's something about symmetric functions that, that is still hard, and there's some reason that should be. Um, and there's another obvious question, what is A of 6? And uh, now there's 2 to the 128 combinations. And so you know, there's no amount of symmetries that I can think of that's going to give anyone near being able to do this. And so if you have any mathematical insights, that would be great. Um, and now I'm going to switch to the other sequence. The other sequence is, is a more recent one. It's A129403. It's based on a paper that I found when I was doing some, uh, uh, a few papers I found when I was doing some, some research into regular expression implementations. And it concerns regular expressions, which are a way to match uh, strings with patterns of the form A question mark, B question mark, C question mark, et cetera, through the alphabet and stopping you know, when you get to the end of your letters. And so for n equals 4, it's A question mark, B question mark, C question mark, D, which matches you know, either an A or nothing, a B or nothing, a C or nothing, a D or nothing. So it's strings where there's at most four letters, they appear most once, and they appear in order. And so there's an algorithm for turning a regular expression like this into a finite automata. This is a non-deterministic finite automata. And at any step, it starts on the left side, and it proceeds through as it reads the input. At any step, it can decide to read a letter, or it can decide to skip over reading a letter and just jump to the next step via a dashed line. And those dashed lines are sometimes called empty transitions or epsilon transitions. And so this is a perfectly good NFA to match that pattern, and it's, it's the best way you can do this. But some people ask, well, what, if you, what about getting rid of the epsilon transitions? And it turns out that the epsilon transitions are not uh, fundamental, and that you can, in fact, do it without the epsilon transition. So here's one way to compile out the epsilon transitions. Just every time you have an arrow, follow all the epsilon transitions and add those arrows too. And so you end up with this kind of rainbow. Uh, instead of trying to label each arrow, I just use colors, so red, orange, yellow, and blue for A, B, C, and D. And we basically have almost every possible uh, arrow from one node to another with, with the letters that, uh, that actually work for that. And so this is a cubic number of arrows. The question is, well, how many arrows do you actually need? Um, so it turns out that for this one, the optimal one only has that many arrows, as opposed to this kind of rainbow. Um, and so you know, how, how do you get that, and, and what is the, the actual minimal number of arrows in general? Uh, I want to point out that the previous one is actually unique and optimal for, for n equals 4. If you drop down to n equals 3, there are two optimal ones. Um, so, so it's not always unique. And in fact, this bottom one is non-deterministic. It has the same non-determinism we had on the previous one, where when you read the initial A, you can follow either one of the red arrows. And then after that, you only have one choice, it turns out. Um, and this top one is, is interesting because it's such a small problem that you can actually do it deterministically. Uh, when you read the A, you go there, and, and, and so on. And in general, the deterministic one is going to have uh, more states, but, but this one worked out. 
And so back we have this worst case. How do we figure out um, you know, what, what the smallest number of arrows we want that we can get is? Well, first you have to figure out how are you going to structure the NFA. And it turns out there's an argument I'm not going to go into that you only need these five states. You need a state for I will take an A now, I will take a B now, I will take a C now, and I will take a B now. And if you're in the I will take a B now state, you'll also take a C or a D. Um, potentially. And so there's an argument that that's, that's all the states you need. So that gives you a structure where, okay, now we just have to think about placing arrows. And because we have to accept the string A, B, C, D, those four arrows are required. Uh, and similarly, the same argument, because we have to accept the string B, C, D, and you start at the, the left side, we have to have that arrow, the, the first bent arrow that goes to the, the C node, the, the B, C, D, and then C, D, and then D, those are all required as well. And so we've at least eliminated some of the arrows from consideration. They just have to be there. Um, sorry, that slide's not supposed to be there. Uh, and then there's some useless arrows. So if you're in the A, you're in the beginning state, and you see an A, a B, or a C, which are these, these non-blue colors, there's no point in jumping all the way to the I'm done with the string state, because we're going to define that all of the nodes count as I'm done with the string states. And so these, these transitions are completely useless, because that's, that's effectively a dead end. And you might as well go somewhere that could help you if there were more um, And so again, here's the worst case. And now we've reduced the search space from the worst case arrows, this sort of giant rainbow, to this slightly smaller rainbow, uh, which is still bad, but it's not as bad. And in general, <coughs> for various sizes. The first column of arrow, arrow numbers is the actual cubic number of all the arrows that we can consider. And then the second column is the ones that we haven't fixed, the ones we didn't say have to be there, and the ones we didn't say can't possibly help. And so they're both cubic. They're both in the OAIS. You can look them up, and that's how you can find the formulas. Um, but uh, you know, the second one is at least a little bit smaller. And so um, you, know, you notice n equals 7 is about 50. So up until that point, you could probably just try all possible, do I take this arrow or not? 2 to 50 is not that big a deal, as we saw. And so I did that uh, in 2007. I wrote a program that just tried all the possible arrows and checked whether the, the NFA actually did the right thing. And, and it turns out that <coughs> we saw the, the one for n equals 4 before it had 9 arrows. And for 5, you get 13. And 6, you get 18. And 7, you get 23. But the, the rest of them seemed like they were probably going to be out of reach. Two of the 77 is a little too much, and, and the rest are even bigger. And so I put that to the side, um, sort of done my due diligence. I submitted it to the OEIS and found in the paper, uh, computer sequence, put it in, and then we put it away. And then about six years later, Neil sent me an email saying, hey, this paper just appeared on the archive server. It has a link to this sequence. Uh, I can't quite tell whether it's uh, you know, proposing an upper bound for the sequence or is actually extending the sequence, you know, can you look at this? And I said, sure, that's interesting. And so there's this paper on the archive server, and they give this interesting upper bound sequence, it turns out, because they have an algorithm for generating these NFAs, and this is the number of arrows that their algorithm produces. And so we don't know that these are minimal, but we know that it's an upper bound algorithm. And uh, it actually matches uh, up to n equals 7, and they observed in the paper that, you know, by citing the sequence, that they were minimal up to n equals 7. And then after that, they had these, these nice upper bounds. Uh, and I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. Maybe I can do a little better. And so I thought about it for a while, and I realized that, um, you know, maybe we can do some pruning during the search. And so if we order the search this way, where we choose all the A arrows, and then, make, you know, we make a decision for every A arrow, then we have to check that actually A is accepted by the NFA. And if it's not, there's no point in going forward, because we're, we're done with the A arrows. If it didn't get A, you know, it's useless. It's not going to work. And then similarly, you choose all the B arrows, and you check that B and A, B are both accepted. And you check all the C arrows, and you check all the strings with A, B, and C, and so on. And if you do this pruning, you can actually cut the search space quite a bit. And you get a little further. So now I have entries for N equals 8 and N equals 9, and it matched the paper, which is kind of interesting. <coughs> And so that's where things stood for a little while. And then I was talking to Alex Healy again about this. And, and he pointed out that you know, maybe it would make sense, instead of selecting arrows, to select ways to match strings. Because in the, the search that I've been doing, once you pick a bunch of arrows, you have to then run every string through the NFA to check and see if it actually is a valid one. Uh, 
uh, it, is, it checks and matches all the strings. And if instead you started with kind of all the possible ways that an FA might match a string, and just took one, comp one, one of the ways for each string and combined them, then by construction, you're guaranteed that the NFA is going to match all the strings it's supposed to, and you just have to find the minimal combination. And so <clears throat> for this example we've been using, N equals 4, these are all the NFAs that, that the algorithm would have to consider. And for a lot of them, there's only one. And so you just have to take that one in order to get that string. Uh, but then you know, for AC, there's two choices. And so you know, during your search, you have to sort of explore both branches. Do I use the first way or the second way? And that sort of leads to different classes of NFAs. Uh, and, and so in the observer people will notice that you know, for the, the A there, I've got this red arrow that just goes to the next state. But you could imagine having one where the red arrow goes to the one after that or the one beyond that. And those would actually all be valid too. But I don't consider them choices because I'm still keeping track of those required and, and useless arrows. And if I can do one of these with all required arrows, then that, that doesn't add any complexity to anything that I'm building. And so that's sort of a guaranteed you know, no-op for me. So I don't have to worry about any other choices. Uh, but otherwise, if there's you know, even one non-required arrow in the choice, then you have to sort of expand all the ones that you can, you can possibly do. And so <clears throat> you can see that a lot of them do end up with just one choice. And then there's these you know, twos and threes in this example. And, and for the other ones, there's, there's more. Um, and so you just go through and do all the cross products. So you know, in the beginning, you have nothing. And there's only one choice. You put nothing in. And you do that for the next few steps. And then when you get to the AC step, you've got this machine you've built up. And you try either adding the first one or the second one, and then go, keep going. And if you structure this as a breadth first search, um, you can reduce some, some uh, complication where you might follow different paths and end up with the same set of arrows. And then at that point, the result is going to be the same for these two different ways you got there. And so instead of exploring that whole subtree of the search space twice, you really want to only explore it once. And so if you do a breadth first search that takes care of that at the cost of having to do these lookups. And the tricky part about the breadth first search is that <clears throat> you really want to compact the state space. And in particular, if you have two different NFAs, um, uh, there's actually not an example on the slide, but if you have two different NFAs that uh, one is a complete subset of the other one and you're, you're, you know, they both accept the first 12 strings, then there's no point in, in you know, exploring with the bigger one because you can always add those back if you need them as you go on. But the smaller one is smaller and just as good uh, because it has a, a subset of the arrows. And so what you want to do during the breadth first search is compact this search space so that any time you have this condition where you have one NFA and another NFA, and one is a strict subset of the other, you throw away the bigger one. And in general, there's this superset reduction problem where given L, which is a set of subsets of 1 through N, there's a bug in the slide that's supposed to say strict superset. Um, you want to find all the S such that S is in L and S is a strict superset of some other set in L. And you want to throw away all of those things that are, are supersets. So you want to save the ones that are just minimal uh, subsets. And I don't know how to do this efficiently. And I would love to hear how to do this efficiently. Um, there's an obvious quadratic algorithm. And there's a less obvious um, way to do this with uh, some you know, intermediate data structures to help with the lookup in the quadratic algorithm. It's still quadratic, but has a much better constant. And so that's what I'm doing, and it uses a lot of memory, and it's still pretty slow, but it does work. Um, and that got us a little further. And um, then it got us all the way through 10, 11, and 12. And uh, there's two amazing things about 10, 11, and 12. One is that it actually does match the archive paper. <coughs> Uh, the other is that you know this, this algorithm is really strange at this point. For the, the n equals 12 case, the maximum Q I had at one point was about 266 million entries. And that was reduced from about 280 million entries on that particular round. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but on every round you have to keep doing this pruning because otherwise it just multiplies. Um, and if you could do this pruning over you know, close to a billion entries more efficiently, then I think we could get a little further in the sequence. And I'd love to hear ideas for that. Um, but, but it matches this paper, and, and I think that's just amazing, but I don't know why. Um, the paper itself doesn't go into why this algorithm might be minimal. I sent email to the authors, um, and they haven't responded, um, which is fine. But um, <coughs> so, so there's a simple question, like, does it actually continue? So the paper conjectures, you know, there's an upper bound of 60, and is the next one 60? And, and I don't know. For n equals 12, it took about a day of CPU time 
on a machine that I, I rented from Amazon for $3 an hour that had 32 cores, 244 gigabytes of memory. And I used pretty much all of that memory. Uh, and so I, I definitely can't be 13. That's the most memory machine that Amazon will sell you, uh, rent you. And so we need some sort of better way to, to do the, the, the Q reduction to get. Plus, I think it goes 54 and 55. Yes, so, so when, I, when I do the searches, I already uh, say, if you see an MFA with, with too many arrows, just stop. And so I, I actually started with 51, and then I had to do it again with 52, and then I said, okay, well, I know the answer is 53, but let's see what they are. And, no, but uh, the question mark, can you make the upper bound? Okay. Uh, so the lower bound for the question mark? Oh, the lower bound. No. Um, I would... I would have to think about it. I think probably you can say it must be bigger than the previous one, but um, but I don't. I mean, the pattern here is that they're going up, you know, fours and then five. Yeah, but since it's, uh, but it looks like completely very heavy, yeah. actually, computer, maybe can find lower uh, right at fifty-four, so it's bigger than fifty-four, bigger than fifty-five. Yeah, the, the only way to say that it's definitely bigger that I know of is to enumerate all of those and oh, say that it didn't do it. And so if you construct one, that gives you an upper bound, and that's what they've done. So I don't have a good way to do a lower bound. Um, but it's probably 60, honestly. <laughs> um, uh, and so, so if, you, if you want to, oh, there was one more thing I wanted to read. Um, if you count the number of optimal ones, so we saw that for n equals 3, there's two minimal n phase. And for n equals 4, there's only one. So maybe this will entice you to go look at this problem. The sequence of the count of the number of minimal n phase for each of these is 1. 1, 2, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, 1, 5, 10. <laughs> and that sequence is not in the OEIX. <laughs> because we skip the 1, 3, 3, 1 line of Pascal's triangle. Um, and the paper actually goes into in great detail the Eratosthenes Pascal triangle and the connection it has to their particular construction. Uh, and so if you're really if you're interested, it's, it's fascinating. It's a little beyond me. Um, but there's, there's no reason to believe from the paper that, that this would be minimal. Um, but it's fascinating. If it was minimal, then it would be, just, you know, it would be really easy to do. Um, there's another interesting uh, fact about these, which was that up to n equals 7 and then n equals 9, it also had this property that every string you put through the NFA had exactly one path to the minimal NFAs. And so, uh, which is kind of surprising, right? You're, you're taking the small number of arrows and matching this enormous set of strings, and you would think that in order to match some strings, you might have had to put in arrows such that there were two paths for one of the strings. And up, up through n equals 9, which is where I had stopped until last week, uh, it had this amazing property that, that they were somehow you know, concise NFAs as well. There was only one way to do each possible string. And so uh, Alex had actually conjectured that, well, maybe that's an important property that we could prove. And, and, and then you could, you could prune the search space that way. If you were if it's intermediate NFA, there's two ways to match a string, just throw it out. Um, but it turns out that for n equals 11, uh, uh, some of the NFAs that it, it built uh, don't actually have this property. So it built five minimal NFAs, and only two of them have this property. Uh, and then for 12, it built 10, and only one of them has this property. Yeah. Um, from the fact that each pathway uh, that, that each string must have a pathway. Right. Can you get a lower bound from the number of possible pathways? Uh, yes, I think you can, but um, uh, I'm not, I mean, it would just be something like you go to 10 or something, right? Because I mean, it's just the base 2 log. Of but I mean, maybe it's not that bad because they're colored labels, so you can get than that. But I mean, the, the lower bound is sort of less interesting, I think, uh, because. Uh, it's probably 16, <laughs> um, but you know, that's, that's where it is. So if, if you know how to do that, that sort of quadratic superset thing, I'd love to hear that. Um, the paper and everything is linked from the sequence. Uh, and so, so these are the, the two sequences. I just want to point out, uh, so there's programs linked from both of them. The top one, I put up a website with the data from the five input Boolean functions. So you can actually just type a, a formula into the website. It will tell you the way to you know, compute with hands and oars for a minimal number of steps, which is almost never useful, but sometimes <laughs> it's and, and it does XOR too. XOR is much simpler because the numbers are much smaller. And then this, the second entry has the, the reference to this archive paper from these authors in France. And um, it's fascinating if you, uh, you know, want to read it. Um, 
Um, and that's all I have for these questions. Yeah. I have a question. So first question about the first sequence, uh, you, you posed conjecture that uh, 